to a very old version of BusyBox. Um, by exporting the path of all of the uh, binary locations, we can see all the system binaries. There's a lot of stuff there. Um, there's stuff to control the radio. There's um, some debug commands that were built in by Basim. Um, but there's just way too much to cover here. Um, what is interesting is that you have direct access to IP tables um, and you can access the CPE tools which allow you to um, directly read and write to certain parts of memory on the device, um, adjust radio configuration parameters and possibly break your device if you don't know what you're doing. So be careful. Um, so the devices have a web interface with a default password of Motorola. You just type in the password. Um, if you look behind the scenes though, it's just passing the username router behind this uh, in the form. Uh, if you change that to admin tools, you log in and bypass any password protections on the web interface. Um, and there's no changing that unless you actually have a shell on a device. So any default consumer device that hasn't been unlocked um, is affected by this. Um, by default, it's not web, web accessible, but if anyone gets on your LAN and you've changed your password on your device, they can get right back in and change everything. Um, this year at B-Sides, I logged in and changed the host name to my username so when people trace right it out, they would see me and be like, who the fuck is that guy? These are some of the clear mobile devices. Uh, the one that you see in the middle is the basic mobile USB stick. It's been out for a while. You plug it into your laptop and you get a 4G connection. It works in uh, it works in Windows and OS 10 now. It's got some people working on trying to get Linux support, but it's still kind of sketchy. Um, the second device that you see is the 3G 4G USB stick and that will actually downgrade to 3G if you're in an area that doesn't have the 4G, which is nice. Um, the next spot that you see here is, or the next device up at the top is the clear spot. The clear spot is essentially a wireless access point, which is really neat because then you can plug in the mobile device and it will use the mobile device to get to the internet and distribute out the connection to a local wireless network so anyone can connect in. And by default, the la er, all the passwords for the clear spot to log on and to get into the admin interface is the last three bytes of the MAC address in hex form, so six characters. And you can just see that from the network traffic. So that's not necessarily the best default password to use if you're going to use a default password. But Haha, <laughs> you have to listen to me again. Uh, so the, the mobile devices, eh, not quite as exciting, less RAM, less flash, a uh, little bit faster processor. It's a weird one. It's a, a mass or massy. I'd never actually seen one of these before, you know, but not that I've seen much. Um, the chip debugging is a royal pain in the behind. Uh, it's not using standard JTAG. It's using SPI. Now a lot of you are probably familiar with SPI as a, a method for accessing flash or uh, a RAM or, or other devices. Um, but for actually doing debu debugging, it's kind of a strange thing. I, I've never seen it before. I had to read some articles to figure that one out. Um, it's using a completely proprietary instruction set which makes it a challenge to figure out exactly what's going on inside. And it's definitely not running Linux. Um, so at that point, I became a lot less interested in it. But in order to figure that out, of course, you have to figure out what's in the board again. And uh, since the JTAG interface was non-existent, and that was really frustrating for me, I didn't really know how to pull the memory out of the or the pull the dumps out of the flash. Um, so I got creative. And uh, oh, I just gave it away. Shoot, I was gonna show something else, which got oh, there it is, in the wrong order. Interesting. Uh, <laughs> so if you look at this this chip that's in the red box, and I know that you can't actually tell from where you're sitting, most likely, um, the solder job on that chip looks really horrible. It's because uh, I did it by hand, um, and basically what I did is I just pulled a flash off of the uh, 
the clear spot and I put it onto a different device. And I'm curious if anybody out there can recognize that device. I heard Linksys. Is it a WR54G? No, it is not. It's close though. Oh, hand over here. Motorola surfboard. Motorola surfboard, that is correct. What model? Well, okay, <laughs> cheater. Yeah, okay, so here's a closer view. Um, yes, it's the Surfboard 5120. And uh, yeah, that board has MIPS 32, EJ tag, all the stuff that I'm totally familiar with, which is basically the same as on the, uh, um, the, the home router. Uh, so I was able to just drop the flash on there, and my tool set was already ready for me. And I was able to pull the flash off like that. Um, so this is a, a mod that uh, was done by a friend of ours, uh, Loki, um, basically just putting a big antenna onto the USB stick and uh, it works great. Um, so there's a lot of different options as far as the, the mobile devices and uh, tearing them apart and playing with them. This is the HTC Evo. I'm very happy to have gotten mine uh, a couple weeks ago. It is the first mobile device that has the 4G built into it and so it uses WiMAX. It uses a Sequans chipset so it's a bit different than anything that we've really looked at before. But when I was uh, getting familiar with some of the Android tools, I did the whole ADB shell and poked around a bit and noticed that if you use get prop and set prop, you can list out a lot of the variables that are stored in the um, the like environment variables sort of deal that has a lot of the configuration details for the WiMAX, which is really interesting, and it'll tell you things about the like towers that you're connected to and like MAC address and just a whole bunch of really interesting numbers. Uh, when I flash my modem using Toast's what step two of the how to root your Android, I noticed that he had uh, modified an engineering build of the Evo firmware, which is really neat because that came with a bunch of diagnostic tools for WiMAX. And I ripped those APKs out of that build and put them on the website. And so now, if you download the APKs, you can install them onto whatever version of the phone that you have. So that's kind of fancy and it lets you see things like tower connectivity and little debug logs and all sorts of fun with that. Uh, also, if you have a rooted phone, you can do the WiMAX tether, which essentially turns the phone into a clear spot, which is really nice. And it also has really good access controls. Uh, yesterday, I got to play with a deactivated Evo and I noticed that even when it has no service, you get the captive portal page and the captive portal page can be bypassed with the same techniques that were discussed earlier except it's on a phone which is nice. Uh, right now if you want to be using WiMAX on the phone you pretty much have to be using 2.1 which is like Android 2.1 which is the version that comes with the phone and I've messed with Fresh and I've messed with Damage Control and they both seem to work fine for the WiMAX uh, Cyanogen does not quite work yet, but ToCFH and the other guy uh, are working really, really hard on getting that working. And they're trying to get it working with the Android WiMAX framework that was released from Clear about a year ago, which is neat because then it would all be open source connectivity to the <coughs> drivers. And that will allow Cyanogen to continue to have the uh, 4G in their builds from then on. So by show of hands, how many people here uh, like their privacy when they're using their wireless devices of any kind? Very cool. Uh, you guys are going to be upset with this. Uh, they're running uh, location-based services. A lot of the major telcos, uh, wireless telcos, are getting this all ramped up and they're trying to say that, you know, this is the next thing for social networking and that uh, you should just let all your friends know where you're at, you know, with the phone that's in your pocket, you know, things like Google Latitude are taking advantage of that and whatnot. But uh, with location-based services, with WiMAX, it's a little bit different. Uh, 
basically there's two types of ways you can get uh, your location with uh, clear or sprain or any of them. Uh, the first one is a client server relationship that is done through Ajax and a web page. So you go to the web page or the URL that's listed right there and it will bring up a pretty little Google Maps and put a dot with a circle around it of roughly the location that you're in. The second way is for uh, direct server to server communication and that's using uh, a Parallel X API and that allows me as a developer or the service provider to put in your IP address or MAC address and I can just find out where you're at. Uh, no questions asked and uh, so basically, uh, next. So after playing around with this a little bit, uh, as soon as I got access to this, first thing I wanted to do is find out how accurate is this. I mean, is this something where they're going to be able to drop a missile on your head by using LBS or not? So I set up a script, recorded my location, and just drove around town for hours and hours and hours. And it was actually pretty impressive driving around. Like you maintain connectivity at 60 miles an hour going down the freeway. So I was pretty impressed by that. But I started to notice that uh, through the Parallel X API, all the ranges I was getting seemed to be predefined. It wasn't dynamic. And all the ranges are listed right there that I saw driving around town and there was nothing in between those numbers. So you can see the level of accuracy that the location-based services has. Now, the way they're doing this is based on the tower and the sector panel uh, location and the orientation of that panel. They keep track of every panel. They know exactly which degree it is pointing. And then they take the power reading and basically are determining how far away or how accurate that is. However, they are working on uh, using multiple towers to help basically triangulate where you're at and to increase the accuracy of that. It is being worked on, but there has not been an announced ETA on that. And I'm kind of curious to see how accurate that's going to be and see if the predefined ranges kind of goes out the window and it gets a little bit more accurate. So this is the part that really kind of caught my attention was that with the location based services if you go sign up or you just buy hardware you're opted in by default. And if you don't like that, tough shit. They don't let you opt out. You have to email engineering. You got to get a hold of the right people in the engineering department and say I want my LBS turned off. Otherwise, doesn't matter if you're using Sprint Comcast, Clear, Time Warner, it, someone gets your IP address, they can pop it in there and find out roughly where you're at. And another thing we noticed driving around is that there seems to be random dead spots throughout the network. And it's like you just, you're on one tower and you drive into this area and you're gone. Like LBS quits reporting, gives you back a service error and you just find a dead spot. So. Uh, that might be interesting if anyone's doing any fun things over WiMAX. Uh, you might want to maybe play around with that and go find a dead spot. That might be advisable. So, right now, none of these uh, WiMAX devices have an open source firmware, and that's definitely something that I think would be really cool to see in the future. Uh, we're also looking at trying to put something like OpenWort on one of these home devices to actually get real control and package management on what's going on on the system. Um, also, the future of WiMAX, the 802.16m spec provides a uh, one gigabit fixed bandwidth which is pretty fast and I, I don't know how they're going to pull that off. I mean, I've, <laughs> I've looked at the spec, but I've seen it in labs, and I don't know how they're claiming they're going to get one gigabit a second over the airwaves. I just, I don't buy it. I'll believe it when I see it. Did you want to? Um, so I just uh, posted some stuff to our Google group, which um, will be listed on a slide later on. Maybe it's the next one. Oh, what do you know? There it is right there. So there's the YMAX Hacking Google Group. 
Das 